a large majority of sex offenders use power as an influence of their offending behaviour. And I think that power played massively into him. You know, he was a completely narcissistic, egotistical control freak and had his way, you know, nearly all the time. So when he thought that, well, I want it, I'll have it, he just went and did it. And of course, nobody challenged him. He was fairly untouchable. He was fairly unchallengeable. And he lived a consistent lie. How do you describe what you do for work? Well, I think now it's probably as an investigative reporter. I do do some private consultancy and I also run a risk management consultancy where I investigate and help organisations with dangerous offenders. So I'm a pretty busy person. But you used to be a police officer, right? So what's the difference between a police officer and an investigator? So yeah, former police detective... And not a massive amount, certainly not the way that I do it. I mean, there there are many different investigators out there who do things in different ways. But my ethos and the way I operate is very much along the same lines as if I were a detective. Obviously, I don't have the powers of being a detective. I don't have the warrant. But what I do have is the skills that I've learned from being a police detective. And I just transfer them into the roles that I do now. I have the same ethical approach. I have the same uh, moral approach in terms of how I do things. And all of my investigations are built around as if I was doing it for a criminal investigation. So the same levels of standards apply. What are some of the restrictions that you have placed on yourself? Obviously, you're not going to be able to go and arrest people. So is it your job as an investigator to put together a a kind of case and then pass that up to authorities that can bring people to justice? How does it work? Yeah, so obviously I don't have a power of arrest, so I can't force people to talk to me. I can't force people to come with me and do things. But as an investigator and the way that I work within the media, often that actually doesn't make that much of a difference because what it does mean is that people will talk to me and they'll often talk to me when they wouldn't talk to the police and they'll give me information that they wouldn't or don't give to the police. So I have a great opportunity, I think, when I go and do these investigations as not being a police officer. That said, of course, I don't have access to the records that police officers do, so I can't gain as much information about people. Uh, But what I have to use is my own sources and also the open source data that exists around the internet to try and find information about people when I'm doing an investigation. My ethos always is about helping people. So whenever I take on any investigation, the starting point is, can I make a difference? Because more often than not, by the time people have come to me, is they've tried everything else. They've failed with the police. They've failed with all the other organisations or media outlets. And they come to me in desperation. Can I help them? And what I will never want to do is to give people false hope. It is about being realistic to them. So if I can't genuinely can't see anything that I can do as far as adding value, I'm no wizard. But what I do is obviously um, thoroughly investigate and use my skills very successfully. If I can't help them, then I'll be honest up front and say, look, there is is there's nothing I can do because there's nothing worse than being given false hope. It seems crazy that you, without access to records and fingerprints and so on and so forth, that you can do more than the police. I guess it shows the power of finding sources, getting information from people using those, I guess, what would you call them, sort of softer styles of investigation? Yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't say in every circumstance I'm better than the police at all. I think what I can provide is a uniqueness in terms of a dedicated approach. Of course, the police have huge workloads. Uh, My workloads are high, but they're in a very different way. So I have to prioritise and say, right, I'm going to really focus on this case now and just, just totally look at it, put everything else to one side. Whereas the police can't always do that. They have to manage a number of cases at the same time. Are you legally allowed to surveil people if you're not the police? Yeah, absolutely. So not necessarily in some foreign countries. It's a bit problematic. Certainly in Portugal, there's not meant to be doing any private investigations. But uh, I have done it in Portugal and I've done it in many other countries. But in the UK, absolutely no problems at all. You know, you have to be aware of people's privacy and you have to do it in a certain way. But you can absolutely do surveillance on people and I very regularly do do. You tap people's phones? Is that something that's allowed? No, you can't do that. And in fact, the police you know, can't do that without very high authority. So you can't do anything that's overly intrusive. 
What you can do, of course, is use techniques that enable you to gain access to people. So sometimes, you know, we might run a decoy, we might run a courier pretending to, to look for somebody or deliver a package, and that will often lead to identifying where somebody is. Uh, we might use trackers. Uh, we might use listening devices, all of those little techniques now, which are very readily available and, and easily applied to gather intelligence but, or, or information. But it's always about a bigger cause. You know, it's about being proportionate. If I'm investigating something, for example, if it was very minor, then one has to look at the proportionality of the techniques that you're employing. The more serious it is, the more serious the techniques that you can apply. If someone's wanted for murder, or wanted for very serious offences. And of course, the proportionality of what you're going to deploy and use increases. What was your role in the Jimmy Savile case? Well, Jimmy Savile, I was, I was actually coming back from uh, Interpol. I'd been over there making a film for BBC Newsnight. And the producer said to me, have you ever heard anything about Jimmy Savile as being a sex offender? And I said, well, no, he's a very strange bloke, but I've never heard that. And he said, no, he is. You know, my, my aunt was at a, a school where he used to visit and there's a lot of chat online about it. And he said, yeah, we've been looking at it and we're looking to do something. And I said, well, I've never heard anything about that. Anyway, then moves forward over the next few weeks. And he said, look, we've, we're aware that apparently he was arrested by a police force, either Surrey or Sussex. You know, do you think you can find out? Well, I was in Surrey Police and uh, and I could tell him that it didn't happen during my time in the police. So it had, must have happened after that. And then when I looked into it, I established that it had been a case that Surrey Police had looked at. Passed that back to him. And Newsnight at that point then said, well, we can't show any failings by the police. So we're going to drop it. Uh, and he said to me, you know, Newsnight aren't going to run it. And I said, well, that's mad because I've now done some digging myself. And there clearly looks to be something there. There still needs an awful lot of work to stand it up. I mean, they were a long way away from standing up a program to make any any uh, any difference. And I said, well, let me let me look at it. So I did. So I set off on a path to try and establish victims and see what the accounts were. And as a direct result of that, 12 months later, made a program and kind of the rest is history really you know 3rd of October 2012 was a pretty momentous occasion not just in terms of showing what Jimmy Savile did but actually making a difference for the rest of certainly the UK and actually had ramifications around the world I think if it hadn't been for Jimmy Savile's exposure I wonder whether Weinstein um, and the other individuals who have now been exposed Epstein would actually have taken place because what it did do is it created a tidal shift of attitudes and approach from victims up to authorities who said, you know what, we now need to get a hold of this and we now need to start to listen to people who are telling us about what's going on. You know, no longer should people be untouchable. And and I think there was a a massive, massive change in attitudes as a direct result of that program going out. I think you're right. The reckoning around men in positions of power, abusing that power to gain access to either women or minors. I mean, was it Rolf Harris, who was also mm -hmm. downstream from that? Who was, the, who was the media guy in the UK? So there's Max Clifford, Rolf yep. Harris. Yeah. Um, yeah, there was a there was the uh, the Eastern knockout guy. I can't remember his name now. You know, um, Bill there Cosby. Was a number of in Bill Cosby. You know, there's a number of individuals. Certainly, Rolf Harris and Max Clifford. You know, I was instrumentally involved in both of those cases as far as bringing them to the police and getting the police to investigate them. And you know, people would turn around afterwards. There were some critics who said, "Yeah, but you're just going after the celebrities." Well, well what they didn't realise is, as a result of getting those people who were the most powerful untouchable. It meant anybody was touchable. It meant anybody could be got. And therefore, up and down the country, teachers, scoutmasters, you know, those people in positions of trust who were having access to children were being arrested. And I can tell you that the knock-on effect of that was phenomenal. You know, we got contacted by the NSPCC in the weeks after the uh, programme went out, you know, just telling us the massive difference that has the result of our program has made to the amount of people calling into their hotline and the amount of cases that were coming in 
And I know because of my work with police forces up and down the country, that they saw a significant spike in new cases. And as a result of that, victims coming forward and offenders being caught. And I think it genuinely did make offenders think that the next knock on the door could well be from the police. Yeah, I mean, if you can get a Harvey Weinstein or a, an Epstein or a, a Rolf Harris or a whoever, you can get anyone. It really yeah. does sort of plant a flag in the ground and say, okay, you think that you're safe in your position of power as, like you say, a teacher, scoutmaster, priest, whatever it might be. If you can take down people at the top of the tree in terms of media, it really does, I suppose, put the shits at people that think they can get away with it being below the radar. So talk to me about the difficulties in investigating that. I mean, apart from the fact that he was this huge media personality, I, I guess there must have been so many obstacles in there. Yeah, huge amounts. I mean, I've never spoken about it. And my book talks about the case. And, you know, there's, there's bits and pieces that we did behind the scenes in order to get the programme broadcast, which I've never spoken about and, and I don't think I ever will do. Because I, for me, it was about the five women that came forward and we had to do whatever we could to try and get it broadcast. And, and thankfully, ITV did broadcast it. But it was really difficult. You know, there was at no stage really during the course of that 12 months investigation was there any time that I thought, you know what, this is a quite an easy investigation to do. At every stage, there was hurdles to face and there was... You know, first of all, how many victims could we find? Was four enough? Was five enough? Was six enough? Was seven enough? How many was enough? You know, would we get the authorities to believe us? Would we would we get the public on our side? Were people prepared to talk to us? You know, would people give up their anonymity to go on telly and explain that they were a victim of abuse? What was the fear of being sued? You know, what was the damage to us doing? I mean, I remember very clearly that my producer and I you know, we, we talk about it yeah, during the course of that 12 months. It was a consistent thing. And I remember saying to her once, you know, if we don't, if this program doesn't land right, we'll never work in telly again. Um, you know, we put, our, we put ourselves on the line absolutely to make that program. And, and of course, the women did more, you know, those victims of his. For them, it was not only have they gone through all that abuse, but for them to give up their identity in the ways that they did was was huge far bigger than the risk that i took but there was a risk you know there was a personal risk and damage that i may never have ever worked in television again if we'd have got it wrong and no one had supported us and gone with us and even up until the last moment i mean i remember doing an interview for bbc radio leeds the day before the program broadcast and the reporter there who was very supportive of savile because savile was from leeds was basically saying, you know, you, who do you think you are to be the judge and jury, you know, to, to put this programme together when, they, when the man's dead? I mean, my response very clearly was, and I wrote a piece about this, and said, look, you know, I'm not judge and jury. All I'm doing is presenting the facts. You are the judge and jury. The public are the judge and the jury. Ultimately, you will decide whether or not you believe the evidence being presented. All I'm doing is putting it out there. And then it's up to you to make your decision. So... Savile was alive when you started your investigation, but no, 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 he died. He died by the time. So he was alive when Newsnight started theirs. Yep. Then he died. But by the time I started my investigation, he had already died. Did the fact that he was dead make things easier or harder? Oh, it would never have broadcast in a month of Sundays if he'd have been alive. No one would have touched it. And it was hard enough to get it touched. And he was alive when he was dead. Nobody would have touched it. You know, I did a, a big piece in The Guardian about that that was very clear that had Savile still been alive, our programme would not have gone off the ground. It wouldn't have even moved forward. There'd been no traction for it. Nobody would have been interested in broadcasting it. And that tells you a lot about the power that he had, even when he was still dead. Was that just him wielding solicitors left, right and centre and threatening to sue people? Yeah, incredibly litigious. The victims wouldn't have stood up for it because they'd have been sued by him and the broadcaster wouldn't have tread it, wouldn't have trodden there because they wouldn't have wanted to face the backlash from him and the financial implications from it. Why is it that so the police were notified of this, Sussex police or Surrey police had been notified that there was something to investigate, but they hadn't got anywhere with their investigation how did it come to someone 
Like, wh why was television the place that justice was found as opposed to in the police? Well, there was three allegations that were made. They went to Surrey Police. Surrey Police investigated it. And as a result of that, interviewed Savile at Stoke Mandeville Hospital, interviewed him in relation to sexual offences, didn't make any contact with the hospital to tell them that they were going to interview an individual on their grounds for sexual offences, which is astonishing. Uh, he gave his account, basically said none of it's true, absolutely load of rubbish. Um, and Surrey Police decided to, well, within conjunction with the Crown Prosecution Service, uh, closed the case. But significantly, without making any inquiries, had they have followed up on some of the things he'd have told them, they could have shown that that wasn't true, that he was lying. Uh, and simply fell, sadly, years later to me to pick it up and, and do the job properly. It seems crazy that there's things that you can do that the police can't, that there's lines of inquiry that get chased up. I suppose you're right. The fact that your um, focus is narrowed for a, for a period of time really, really does make one team look at a particular case. Yeah, I find that fascinating. I find it absolutely fascinating that you can have somebody who's got the expertise and outside of the institution that's able to do that work. Yeah, I mean, I'm not the only person, I'm not the only investigative reporter that's out there that does these types of things. Um, but it's about, you know, it's also about having the experience and, and having the ability to go and do those things. I mean, the police officers that were investigating that case made some fatal mistakes. The Crown Prosecution Service made some very fatal mistakes. Uh, and, you know, sadly, you, whatever you do, you know, you could, you could easily say, well, they're busy, they're overworked, they've got so many cases. That doesn't wash, does it? It doesn't wash at all because as far as the victims are concerned, they don't care whether you've got another case. You know, I, I want you to deal with my case properly. And so when one argues and says, well, I'm just so busy, I didn't do it properly. It's like, well, you shouldn't have done it then. Was there anything unique about Savile? Obviously, he's outwardly, he's a bit of a weird guy, but was there anything particularly unique about him that sort of came up during your investigation as well? Yeah, I mean, I think the uniqueness of Savile, and it really is a uniqueness, it was his broad of his, the broadness of his offending. So he offended against predominantly women, overwhelmingly women, uh, from all age groups, from 12, 13, all the way up to 50, 60. I think one of his latest victims was 70 or something. But, it, but real broad range of offending behaviour, which is very strange because he quite clearly was interested in, in young children, you know, 14, 15, around uh, puberty ages. But he also had an interest in women who were a lot older than that, which is very strange for an offender. You wouldn't normally have such a broad range of, of offending behaviour targeting group. What do you think that says about him? Uh, well, I think a lot of his effect, I mean, it, it becomes quite a complex process, but I think in terms of offences, offenders, why do they offend? A large majority of sex offenders use power as an influence of their offending behaviour. And I think that power played massively into him. You know, he was a completely narcissistic, egotistical uh, control freak uh, and had his way, you know, nearly all the time. So when he thought that, well, I want it, I'll have it, he just went and did it. And of course, nobody challenged him. He was fairly untouchable. He was fairly unchallengeable. And he lived a consistent lie. You know, his ideas that he was out doing lots of... Um, marathons and things like that. I mean, he, I think he finished two or three marathons in his life and he was meant to have finished about 30 or 40. He would start the marathon, his roles would pick him up and he'd be dropped off just before the end and, and come out. You know, he'd go to charity events and he'd be there for 10 minutes and then he'd disappear, be paid for the full time. He was a complete charlatan, you know, but very, very good at it. You know, he, he pulled the wool over his eye and for a large majority of people, if I can work 20% but get paid 100%, I'll do it. And, and you know, majority of people would work like that. Do you think that him creating his children's shows was his way of gaining access? I think it was. I wrote a piece in the Radio Times, and, and there was a number of people who said, that actually, you know, that's not true. But the evidence would suggest that it was. Whether it was subconscious or whether it was a deliberate act by him, there's no doubt that by having a, a chat show or a show like Jim Will Fix It enabled him to get access to children. And predominantly, his offending behaviour was against young people, children. 
So whether it was subconscious or not, or whether it was a direct decision by him, I have no doubt that that played absolutely into his offending behaviour. Did he ever cross over to boys or men? Well, there were a number of allegations of males that he'd sexually abused who were around the teenage years. I never saw any evidence about that, and I'm not suggesting that they weren't, they aren't correct, uh, but I never saw any evidence of his offending against males. Mm, interesting. So is it just his power that allowed him to get away with this for so long? Yeah, I think essentially, I think he became fairly untouchable. And as a result of that, I mean, there were people through the over the years who could quite easily have stopped him uh, before he became a very powerful person, but they didn't do anything about it. And as a result of that, his power increased, his offending behaviour increased, and he could get away with it. He knew he could get away with it. He knew that no one was ever going to challenge him. Because if he did challenge him, by the time he got to such a position, he was so um, powerful. He, he was able to be very litigious. Presumably that means that there were other people who were either willfully ignorant or negligent or turned a blind eye or perhaps even complicit. I know that one of the bigwigs at the BBC had to resign in the aftermath of this, but do you think that there's still more fallout? Are there still more conspirators or enablers out there that probably do oh, need to be called to justice? Undoubtedly. I mean, there are people out there who knew knew that he was offending, not to the degree necessarily of what it was. I don't think anybody knew about that other than him. But there will be other people who knew about his offending or knew about his inappropriateness working in the field that he was and did nothing about it. Uh, and one of the massive problems is, and so there's a number of television programmes that have been made at the moment. His anniversary is coming up very soon. And there's a number of programmes that were made, that are being made around it. Uh, and I've not taken part in any of those. And quite simply because... You know, Savile now really is a matter. I've put it behind me. It's a, for, it's a position. I've done the job. I've, I've done my work. I've let other people now get on with their bits. But it's still unfinished in terms of holding people to account. And until somebody wants to commission or make a programme which actually holds people to account, then I've got no interest. You know, it's for me, it's not about going over, you know, his offending behaviour again. We know that. That's been covered extensively. And what we now need to do is hold people to account. And until somebody wants to do that and commission a programme to do that, then I'm not interested. How many people do you think he abused? Well, when we did the investigation, we said in excess of 500. Uh, and that might seem strange to people, but it's a figure, having worked in child protection for a long time, that I know that someone of his age is likely to incur that amount of contact with vi that many victims. And it's interesting, when we met the officer in charge of the Metropolitan Police Operation Utrecht, he came to meet us at ITV and we had a meeting and he said, you know, after an initial uh, assessment of the case, we reckon there's probably about 30 or 40 victims. And I went, 500. And he went, really? And I went, yeah. He said, well, I'll bow to your, your, your knowledge, having investigated them for the last year. And of course, when the final report came out, there was just an excess of 500 victims. I suppose so, that's what happens wrong, when you're really. around for that long, right? If you've been in this position of power for such a long amount of time, mm. it just gives you this constant access. Yeah, that's, um, mm. that's terrifying. Another thing to consider as well that I thought was quite interesting is obviously Louis Theroux, who, from what I know, is a pretty shrewd guy, seems like a smart fella. He's able to exist on multiple planes at once. He can play with power dynamics within the documentaries that he does to great comedic effect. And he didn't see it. Not the first time that he met him. No, I, I mean, I, no. I think it's when you're in immersed in that, I mean, I know Louis fairly well. When you're immersed in something like that, I think it, it's very easy to have the wall pulled over your eyes unless you step back from it and you have the ability to to be objective and detangle yourself from the whole thing. And I think Louis got caught up in it all. And as a result of that, I actually became friends with him. I mean, I, he, there's a very strange Louis through programme, which was the one that he did for his last programme about Savile, where he said, it was, was really about Louis. It was a very strange programme where he talked about the impact that it's had on him, about he became friends with him. He spent mm -hmm. a lot of time mm -hmm. with him. Um, and... Yeah, I mean, it, you know, he he 
he had the opportunity. I mean, he was, in a way, you could say, well, Louis missed it because Louis had the opportunity when he was in the car with him talking about, you know, interested in children to take it to the one step further and and actually talk to people around and find out those people that didn't like Savon and why didn't they like him and what was everything going on. But I think he he got caught up in it all. And of course, when you're immersed in that and you're being given access to an individual, the access they'll give you is the access they want to give you. Yeah, he's the gatekeeper so you, here. He's totally the gatekeeper. So you then have to step outside that and go, do you know what? You know, when I investigated uh, Oscar Pistorius, you know, in terms of the case or the programme that we made for Oscar, one of the things I said right at the very beginning is, Oscar, you know, I'm going to go to perhaps places that you are uncomfortable with. Uh, you know, I will I will set the scene here, not you. You're giving me access, but I'll take where I will go wherever I want to go. And that might mean asking you difficult things. And he was absolutely fine with that. You could never have done that with Jimmy Savile. Jimmy Savile would have gone, no, 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 I'm telling you where to go. He controls the frame. You are stepping into my world. Totally, totally. And you saw that. Well, you see that actually with the majority of people that Louis goes and visits. You know, he visits, it's great access TV, but ultimately he's always doing it on their terms. Correct, yeah. But that's the that kind of side-eye... Um, what's it called, Gonzo's style of reporting, that's, that, mm. that's the way that it works, right? It, the point is that it's a fly-on-the-wall sort of candid yeah. approach. Yeah, I think as well, maybe another thing to, to play devil's advocate for Louis, Savile's such an eccentric overall. You, you kind of don't know what's character, what's truth. There's a lot being thrown at you. I mean, there's that clip that Louis did put just after he's cycling around his living room which is like a bizarre scene from like some horror movie in itself and he says there's this clip of jimmy looking at the camera and going women know too much i don't like women they shouldn't know so much and you think that's in isolation mm. when you take it with the frame of everything else it makes sense mm. but when you've got this guy that says i'm gonna go out backwards so when people look at me they think that i'm coming in i'm coming in forwards they won't know whether i'm coming or going you think right okay this is just a litany of a fucking weird guy. And I think one of, I, you're right. And I think one of the problems with Savile is that he made himself incredibly eccentric. So people didn't know, you know whether, or a lot of people just said, well, that's just him. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's just how he behaves. That's what he is. And I think in order to properly pull Savile apart, it, it also requires you having knowledge of how offenders operate and how devious they are and how they operate and, and grooming. And, and, you know, Louis didn't have that knowledge, uh, understandably so. You know, he doesn't come from that background. So I think it's very difficult to, uh, to, for anybody to have been in an environment around Savile in those days and for the majority of people to actually know, to pick up on it. Uh, they were he was weird you know definitely a strange bloke but you'd if if you spent some time with him and you had the knowledge of how offenders operate i think alarm bells would be ringing very quickly you reckon but you'd have but you'd have to have that knowledge yeah. and you'd have to spend the time with him and you'd have to ask searching and difficult questions and you'd have to know how to do that so i think it's a you know, he was on a pretty safe wicket wasn't he getting louis in there because uh, and the same with Max Clifford. You know, Max Clifford had Louis in. And, you know, for both of those, of course, it raised some slightly strange stuff. But ultimately, they all came out of it okay or well. I'm not sure if you've seen the Andrew Cuomo uh, allegations that are coming out of America at the moment. I think he's the governor of New York. And he has been accused of being very inappropriate with a number of the women that are in his office. And... One of his defences around this is that he's a very touchy, affectionate person. So there's mm. some photos and videos that come out. And what it's made me think is you were talking about Jimmy used his global personality as a smokescreen to make it very difficult to pick out what elements of his personality were predatory and which elements of it were just more of the eccentricity. Whereas mm. Andrew Cuomo has said pr pretty much exactly the same thing, talking about... He his team released a bunch of photos or someone got a bunch of photos together of him, you know, holding hands with other men, 
hugging other men, sort of kissing men on the cheek, just generally being overly affectionate. And you think, well, if you presume that someone isn't that smart, then maybe that's just the way that they go about it. But if someone's a very clever predator, then what they can do is think, right, if it does come out that I, there are accusations around me having touched people, I have this huge backlog of all of this media here that I've created. And I think um, underestimating the level of planning that these people go to is probably an error that we shouldn't be making. Yeah, and I think actually, I mean, I, I can't talk about his case because I don't know it, but I think also there are cases where individuals are are very, you know, contact. They, they do have a lot of contact. And actually what ends up happening is that they take that contact too far. Uh, or they end up touching somebody of obviously when there is no consent applied, and I think that's what happens with a lot of people. And, and you know, when we all these people started to be arrested, and, and there was a lot of chat obviously around, you know, these crimes happened a long time ago. Well, let's be very clear: a sexual assault in the nineteen seventies, eighties, and nineties is no different than a sexual assault in two thousand and twenty. You know, the the nature of the offence was the same. It was about you know, not having consent to touch. So nothing changed. What happens is the whole attitude has changed slightly or significantly because what used to be accepted, it wasn't acceptable, but it was accepted because by reporting it, nobody would do anything. You wouldn't be listened to. There wouldn't be any action from it. So people, people just simply put up with it. As a result of that, Nothing was done. Of course, then when they have a voice and they're being listened to, and that the view is that actually, do you know, that isn't acceptable. I mean, there are many people who will be able to tell you, well, those things used to happen at, in offices, you know, up and down the country. People, bosses would do most inappropriate things. And absolutely, they are wrong. You know, they've never been acceptable. So those people who have carried out those acts you know, should should be worried that there are someone that's going to come forward. But let's be clear, you know, the allegations against those people that were convicted and the ones we're talking about were very serious allegations. You know, we're talking about, you know, full sexual contact and, and full you know, sexual abuse of children. Yeah, this is the Premier League of, of predators that we're talking about here. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the scale of offending is, is of a horrific nature and repeatedly and repetitively. And, and of course, they've used their position of trust to abuse. And up and down the country, there will be other people. Uh, you know, I went into, I went into a prison. There's a, a Grendon prison uh, in the UK, which is, uh, I think it's in Oxfordshire. And there's a, um, th- it's a therapeutic prison. And I went and spent half a day there, sat in a room with about 15 or 16 other offenders in there. And part of the process is is they have to be very open about their offending behaviour. And they went around the room, each explaining the offences they had, they committed. And the first man sits there and talks, he said, oh, I I raped a five-year-old, murdered her, and I murdered the uh, uh, partner. Um, And then there's other people talking about it. And, And what was interesting was when I was talking to them is that Every single one of them said at some stage they knew they were going to get caught. It was just a matter of time. And there was one guy who said, look, you know, I used to come home from work and I'd drive around the corner and almost every night I'd imagine that there was a police car on the drive. You know, I was waiting for when that police car was going to be on the drive. And I think in one way that's quite reassuring that offenders think that they will get caught one day. The sad reality is that they don't always get caught. Uh, and, you know, and I spent most of my time now is spent away from my private work around managing dangerous sex offenders is very much around investigating murders, unsolved murders. And up and down the country, there are sadly people walking around who are responsible for a murder who have got away with it and have not yet got caught. And, and that is... That is, for me, horrific. You know, they've taken somebody's life. And sadly, we have far too many unsolved murders in this country. What are some of the most disturbing cases that you've investigated? I think the hardest ones are when I know somebody is guilty. I know someone has done it. I just can't get enough evidence to get them prosecuted. 
And that might be a case of, you know, there's Nicola Payne, who is an 18 year old young girl who went missing in Coventry in 1991. And actually, we're featuring her case at, at CrimeCon this year. And well, I've done an awful lot of work around that. And I have no doubt who the offenders are. Absolutely no doubt. The evidence is, is pretty compelling against them, but just not enough to get them convicted. I've got a, uh, another case that I've taken on more recently, which is the murder of two young boys in Liverpool in the 1980s. And I've now managed to get an interview with the person I believe responsible. And actually, incredibly, he has opened up for the first time and has admitted to being the last person that saw them alive and admitted to something happening when he was with them. And I hope, you know, we're currently working on that to try and get it to a position where we make it into a programme which forces the hands of the Crown Prosecution Service and the police to arrest him and prosecute him. Now they've gone, you know, these are two young boys and the case, for a lot of people don't even know about it. Yeah, that's horrific. Two boys murdered in the 1980s. Why don't we all know about that? And there are other cases. I did a, a big article recently about unsolved murders because I did a, a freedom of information request at every police force to get details of their murders, unsolved murders. And it is frightening. It is genuinely frightening how many murders there are that remain unsolved. I mean, there's, there's a horrific case of a young baby who was sexually assaulted and then... Um, cemented into a barrel and you know that most probably while she was still alive you know that offender's never been caught or offenders have never been caught there's other case there's another case where an individual was cut up and put into a big uh, barrel uh, an oil barrel i mean there are there are shockingly cases where offenders have never ever been caught and, and that for me is the you know the the <sighs> the drive that makes me get out of bed in the morning and go, do you know what? I'm going to go and try and catch somebody else. And I have, you know, I have an incredible amount of, of workload. You know, my next podcast on the detective series is Lee Boxall. Uh, we're just cutting uh, episode one and that will be released within the next couple of weeks. And it's a three parter. And I, and the evidence we have uncovered is phenomenal. It is, you know, we, I will name who I think the killer is. He died uh, about six months ago, actually died during COVID. I wish he was still alive. And actually, I probably couldn't have, I couldn't have been so forceful if he'd still been alive because of the uh, of naming him. But he's now dead, so I can name him. And I will categorically tell you that I think he is responsible. And actually, we've got evidence now from his son and his daughter, who for the very first time have given me some evidence which pinpoints him as being the offender. What happened to those Asian guys that you featured in a series mm. of podcasts that you did? What was the comeuppance with them? So, so that was for the first series of the detective podcast, which was the uh, four men in jail for a um, terrorist attack. They were accused of being involved in a terrorist attack in the West Midlands. And quite clearly the evidence had been planted by the, uh, the police, the police have planted the evidence. Everything tells you that. There's no doubt. Even the judge, you know, alluded to that. He couldn't go as far as to say that it was, but everything pointed that. They constructed it. They put the put the matters there. But as is the case, sadly, for some of these things, when they go wrong, very often the police will just close ranks. The judiciary will close ranks, and I can't tell you whether or not those individuals had any intention to commit a terrorist attack in the UK. But what I can tell you, that the evidence that they were convicted on was fabricated, was made up. And it goes to the heart of any investigation. In fact, my podcast uses this at the very end, is that there is never, in my mind, a case where the means justifies the end. So in other words, you can't make something up just because you think it's right. We have a judicial system in this country and we have to see that through properly. So by creating evidence, by fabricating evidence, that for me it is never acceptable. And I think that's what happened with them. And in fact, in my series two of the podcast, we look at a, mer a lady that was a... a um, Harman Hinda Sangiri, who was prosecuted for a murder in Manchester. And 
it's absolutely clear that it's not murder, it's suicide. She got jailed for what is a suicide. And everyone thought it was a suicide at the time. And then the senior investigating police officer came in and as a result of the, the pathologist saying, well, this looks like murder. And then there follows a path where they then go to prove murder. They had no evidence that it was murder in any way at all. I've looked at it now. We've done a full forensic examination. We've reconstructed the crime scene. We've reconstructed the fight with the, or the so-called fight. We've looked at the injuries and it's now currently sitting with a new pathologist who I hope will concur with my decision. She's out of jail now. Oh, so she's, she's, on, she's no longer license. in jail. She's just come out on license, but she's still a convicted uh, killer. And I hope that the pathologist will concur with, with my conclusion and will get it to the Court of Appeal and her, her um, verdict will be quashed. And interestingly, the senior investigating officer, who I know actually, who gave me an interview, and I think she probably regretted massively giving me an interview, but she gave me an interview. And, and I, one of the things I said to her is, you know, there's no evidence to say that this was murder. Everything pointed to suicide. It all looked like suicide. The whole crime scene looks like suicide. You know, why did you decide that it was murder when it looked like suicide? You know, when it looks like suicide, it is suicide. And, and her response was, if it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. And I went, exactly. You know, and, and what a strange analogy for her to make. I said, well, you, you're spot on there. You made the wrong call, didn't you? And she said, well, no, I don't think we did. I said, well, you did. You know, you put an innocent person to jail. I mean, this is a person she never, she, she's alleged to have turned up with the knife in her handbag and then left without taking the knife with her. And there's none of her forensics on there. And what makes this whole case absolutely bonkers is that it's based on the premise that the, the offender turns up at the crime scene, puts a whole forensic suit on, including gloves, hat, shoes, commits the murder. In the middle of the murder, she changes her, her gloves and puts a different pair of gloves on. She then leaves the property, not leaving a single trace outside of the bedroom, takes her forensic suit off, disposes of her forensic suit somewhere, and that is the basis of the prosecution's case. That's why she had no blood on her clothes, because she carried it out wearing a full forensic suit. Has that ever occurred at any other crime in the UK? No, not that I can find out. Has it ever occurred in any other country? No. <laughs> you know, their analogy or the reasons why they say that this had to be murder was the sheer number of wounds that the victim incurred and you know 40 plus wounds but that takes out and what they failed to acknowledge both the pathologist and the senior investigating officer is that that might be the case in your limited understanding and research around stab wounds but if you do a little bit of research around the world you'll find that there are people who have stabbed themselves in excess of a hundred times and there are lots of cases where people have carried out exactly the same types of injuries that she had. And so when you do the research properly, when you look at it properly, it's a travesty. It's an absolute travesty. She should never have gone to jail. And I hope that the pathologist will concur with our decision and will get it back to the Court of Appeal. And, and she's languished in jail for all those years. Thankfully, she's now home. But hopefully we can clear her name. This is some line of duty shit. It, it, it's funny, really. I mean, you know, by and large, the police are not corrupt at all. No. Uh, and in fact, I often get asked this, you know, do the, do the police set people up? Occasionally they do. Of course they do. It happens in every line of work. And particularly when you've got police officers who hold a lot of power. But overwhelmingly, it's incompetence. It's overwhelmingly a vision that they are right. So one of the positions of the murder manual is and, and training is to allow senior investigating officers to come up with hypotheses in terms of, of what's happened. Because, of course, the victim's dead and the only other person that probably knows what's happened is the offender. So you have to start guessing and you have to start thinking, well, if this evidence is telling us this, this is what's likely to have happened. And sometimes that's right. 
But what ends up happening is senior investigating officers come up with this hypothesis. And then, of course, they then look for evidence to fit that. And you can take all kinds of evidence and make it as strong or as weak as you want to make it. And this is what happens with senior investigating officers. They run down a blind alley to prove their hypothesis, which unfortunately in itself, when you look at it in the light of day without those blinkered visions, blinkered goggles on, you look at it and go, well, that doesn't make sense. Because what is the likelihood of an offender turning up at a crime scene, putting a whole forensic suit on, positioning the body in a certain way, leaving the knife there, coming out of the house, making a phone call immediately to a friend and telling her exactly what happened within the house. All of that doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't make any sense unless you want to change the narrative to make it suspicious. Yeah, you're finding, you're repurposing the facts of the case in order to fit the predefined idea that you have about what happened. And that's what happens. And it's happened in many, many cases. It's happened in um, Jeremy Bamber. It's happened in Jill Dando. It's happened in this case. And I'm sure it's happened in a number of other cases that, you know, I, that I'm not aware of. Speaking of line of duty, apart from the corruption and people shooting their ways out of, of uh, interviews and that really, really, really long buzzer, that happens when they yeah, start yeah. an interview. How accurate is that as a, a representation of what life is like for the police? Yeah, I mean, it's very accurate in many ways. And, and you know, Jed McCure is an is a inspirational writer. He's very, very clever. I know World Productions very, very well. Um, actually, you know, I've, I've grown up in their stable and have a very good relationship with them. They are brilliant. They're absolutely brilliant. But, of course, you know, there is poetic license to some of it. Of course there is. Um, but overwhelmingly, it is it is pretty accurate in most parts, and, and some of it. I think probably the last series slightly stretched the imagination in certain ways, uh, and it probably wasn't the best of endings. No, <laughs> but, God, what a um, fucking shit way to finish a season. Yeah, very, slight, very disappointing, really. And I think some of it got um, uh, yeah, got lost lost along the way slightly. Yeah. which is a real shame because it is an amazing program. Uh, you, corruption does happen in the police force. Of course it does. Uh, because police officers are very powerful people. So they can do an awful lot of things. More so years gone by. You know, the 70s, 80s and 90s, police corruption was at its highest. Really, really bad. Uh, it's far less now because the police do police themselves in sometimes better than they police the public which is disappointing. Um, and I think sometimes they go after ridiculous things. But line of duty, uh, of course, they go after Ben's coppers. That's the basis of why there is. Um, you know, Ted's view is, you know, is, is, a, is he is after Ben's coppers all the time. And of course, they're around. And, and they should be eliminated. You know, they, they need to find those people and get them out of the force as quickly as possible. Uh, and people will cover up for other people. Organised crime, is organised crime involved in some aspects of policing? Yeah, I think that, I think there will be. There will be. Uh, less so in the UK. But you go to some of these other foreign countries, and absolutely. I mean, the chief of police in, in one of the areas in Thailand, I think it's Bangkok, he is currently on the run. You know, he's on the run in relation to having shot somebody in the head with his team because they wanted him to pay a twenty thousand pound bribe and now they've said that during the course of the interview they actually upped it to I think forty thousand. But the background to him is that he, he on his drive in his house he has Ferraris, uh, Rolls Royces, because the play the pay is so bad for the police in Thailand that tends to what happens is when they go to a location to do a search or something, if they have cars there for the offenders, there's a picking order in terms of seniority of the police. Fuck take off. the cars, <laughs> and they will take and they will take the cars, and, and that becomes <laughs> their own cars. And you, know, and you take that to other countries. You know, I've done a lot of work in Cambodia, Thailand. You know, total corruption. You buy yourself out of these places in Cambodia. You know, if you get arrested in Cambodia for child abuse, you can pay your way out of it. Uh, South Africa, you can do that. You know, so the, the, the corruption in in the UK police force 
it's pales, nowhere pales near. In it pales in insignificance when you go to other countries around the world. Uh, but it has been significantly impacted on. There's no doubt that the British police force of the 70s, 80s and 90s compared to what it is now is a world away. The corruption that existed in, the, in those periods of times was frightening. And thankfully, the police has got a grip of us so much of it now. And those people are no longer in the police force because there's no room for it. There's no room for it at all. You know, as police officers, we have a, you know, I say we, I, I was, you know, we sign a note, we, we sign an oath to the Queen to do our duty to the Crown. And it, we, it is down to us to act professionally, morally responsible the whole time. And we have to, to keep that. And whatever the power is, I mean, you can see the power go to some of these people's heads. But whatever it is, you know, we have to be upholding the law. And the moment that we step the wrong side of the law, then we're as bad as they are, aren't we? Yeah. Did you watch Murder Next Door, that Chris Watts yeah, story? What was brilliant. your What was your assessment of him? Oh, I mean, I, firstly, I have to say it's probably the best program I've first film I've watched. Because All archive was, footage as well, wasn't it? All police cam oh, and just was, they filmed nothing for that concise, show. Concise, concise, you know, accurate in the moment brilliant because of course it was all on on the camera and uh or, or interview stuff oh it's brilliant brilliant i mean it was the best program netflix had done for for a very long time um what a nasty piece of work i mean i i think you know i've got a program that's coming out very soon on channel five which is about uh the yorkshire ripper where basically it's the unheard tapes of the yorkshire ripper I managed to get access to someone who'd been visiting him in prison for the last 15 years. And in his dying year, I wanted her to put to him uh, cases that were unsolved and information to get information from him. And she did that. And as a result of that, we've got audio recordings because she recorded all her phone calls with him. And we've got those audio recordings. And I tell you what, it's a fascinating listen. So that was When's that out? out in, well, we're waiting for a broadcast date but it's likely to be september so we were waiting for that it'll be on channel five um and sold internationally as well so that's very exciting uh but i think what it tells you uh, as a result of that we did a lot of work around looking at psychosis and uh, psychopathy and schizophrenia and there is no doubt that the chris watts had psychopathy you, you think know, he was able Ah, oh, he was able. He was a psychopath. He was able to compartmentalize his life. You know, he wasn't in the form of a schizophrenia, which is up and down and all over the place. He had a very, very, he was very cool, calm, absolutely. You know, really dangerous piece of work, and to be able to to kill your children in that fashion, in that way, shocking. That's the thing. The amount of trauma that you would go through. If if you'd done it in a fit of rage, if you'd seen red, it would it would tear people apart. Most people simply wouldn't be able to exist. They'd be shaking in the corner. The PTSD would be unmanageable. And yet yeah. he was able to think rationally, drive them, dispose of them, come back, speak to the police, try and... He was a, he was a psychopath, which actually, it's interesting because, of course... Um, Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, was convicted, and following his conviction, it ended up in the result of him getting a, a, a court, then deciding that he was a psychopath. Uh, sorry, he was schizophrenic, schizophrenic. But actually, that's the wrong category. He wasn't schizophrenic at all. He was a psychopath. You know, there was there was no change in his behaviour. He'd commit a murder. He'd come home. He'd get into bed with his wife Sonia, and he'd wake up the following day in normality. Go about so his business, yeah. Why, that's the sign of a psychopath and you know and exactly what what's is what's is will forever be a psychopath making a murderer what's your thoughts yeah i mean i think you know listen, it could never have broadcast in british television because it was totally one-sided unbalanced um and lacked any integrity from anything other than the one side uh, it drew huge fans it was a massive massive success but ultimately, do I think that he was responsible? Yeah, 
absolutely. I mean, I, 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 you watch the program and you come away after and you think, yeah, you're, you're as guilty as hell. You know, how on earth did human remains end up in you know, being burnt in the grounds of your place? You know, I'm sorry, you know, that's because she was burnt there and you would know about it. <laughs> now, the, the cousin, I think it's the cousin. Brendan, who ended yeah. Up being Brend- Brendan. I mean, I think Brendan is absolutely innocent. Uh, and very sadly, we should never have ever been prosecuted. I mean, the, the actions of that investigator. Yeah, pretty despicable. Shocking, absolutely shocking. Yeah, he should be convicted himself. Uh, and the defence, you know, were, were very poor. You know, they could have really highlighted a whole load of things that would never have got him convicted. So, yeah, a, a, a great visual and, I suppose, entertainment programme but didn't do very much for any credibility. As, a, as an investigator, it was poor. The thing that's really interested me during this conversation is understanding the forcing function of putting something onto television to cause downstream impact with regards to what happens judicially. Mm. I, I, I would have never thought watching... How many seasons of, of your things on Netflix now, the investigative thing? The two. Two yeah. seasons of. Two seasons of that and consistent one-offs and specials and so on and so forth. And you watch it and you think, well, this is, this is interesting. It's almost like it's there for our entertainment. But you forget that after that airs, there are downstream implications that cause mm. investigations to be reopened within the police for evidence to be looked at because there's now societal public pressure. There's press a- attention. There's more, um, it galvanizes presumably the families and other people as well that are a part of that. That to me is, you know, f- I-, I enjoy watching uh, true crime on Netflix. I think they have some really awesome stuff. But I never realized that it was, apart from being entertaining, it's actually like a, a service being done to the I mean, investigation itself. Program. All of my programs are. If you, there's a back end to all of my programs. They all have a value, or they all have a purpose. I mean, my most recent program on ITV, which was the uh, murder of Stephen Clark, you know, as a direct result of our involvement in that program, the parents got cleared of murder. Yeah, you know, we, we, without us involving, without my involvement in the program, they would never have been cleared. And, and I don't know if you've seen it, but it's quite a fascinating program. Um, and, and I think, you know, the series, season two, now, season one of the investigator, when we focus on, uh, in fact, sorry, you are, I'm right. Season two, when we look at Jesse Earl's murder, the young girl in Beachy Head, you know, following that, one of the areas that we focused on and looked at is could we get a new inquest? Because if we can get a new inquest, potentially we can have the body exhumed and then we can collect some evidence from the body. The DNA has never been taken from the body. And that, that's happening, right? Haven't you got some huge turnaround? So... Yeah, so in relation to Jesse Earl on series two, we, as a result of that, have or put in a very detailed application to the Attorney General. And we've now got a position where the Attorney General has allowed us to appeal the conviction. And we're waiting now in high, for the High Court to hear the case very soon. And we're hoping that that inquest will be overturned, which is unheard of. You know, you're lucky if you get one inquest overturned every couple of years. They are so, so rare. So we've managed to get that. And the purpose of it is, and this is where the interest comes. Is so, so you could say, OK, well, get them an, a new inquest. Fine. You know, may get an outcome which is positive. But how is that helpful? Well, the situation is, is that as a direct result of that, we are now hoping that the body will be exhumed, that we can get DNA from the body, we can put DNA onto the national database, we can collect, we can check that DNA across the uh, unsolved uh, crime database and the existing marks and it might link up to items being recovered from an offender that as a result of that could be linked to her so it all has a purpose talk to me about the psychological price that you pay for what you do yeah i mean i think you yeah, pay a massive price i didn't probably think that it was that big an impact on me until more recently you know i have suffered with my mental health over the last two years and and I do have dark days, um, which is 
you know, I, I never thought I'd talk about really because of how dark it's been, but it has had an impact on me. Um, and I try and deal with it, you know, sport and, and uh, getting in the garden and those types of activities have been really important for me. But it is hard. And I think it's hard because you're taking on other people's pain, taking on other people's sadness. And I live in a pretty dark world because of the type of work that I do. But that said, I love it. I wouldn't do anything else. I can't do anything else. Um, and, and I'm passionate about what I do. Genuinely looks like you're built for this. And like you were designed in some lab somewhere to be in this position. Well, if only I was, was it? I can't remember the guy's name that was the $6 million man, but that would be lovely. <laughs> Mark Williams Thomas, ladies and gentlemen, if people want to keep up with what you're doing, where should they go? Yeah, so I've, I've got an um, Instagram account, which is M. Williams Thomas. I've got a Twitter account, which is M. Williams Thomas. And I've got a TikTok account, which is M. Williams Thomas. <laughs> and I keep them all up to date with, with crime related things. Uh, my next program to come out will be the uh, Yorkshire Ripper, which is the tapes of the Ripper. You can check out my podcast at The Detective, which is on, which is on all the podcast platforms. And I'm currently working on, and I'll just leave you with a bit of a tease, I'm currently working on a three-part investigation into the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Serious stuff. Mark, thank you for today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few months. And don't forget to subscribe. It makes me very happy indeed. Peace.